All right, guys, as healthcare supplies are desperately needed across the country, we're seeing big corporations and companies stepping up to manufacture supplies and products that are needed. But we're also seeing individual people jumping in to do their part to help make supplies for their community. And one of those people is Jeff Smith. He's joining us now from Charleston, West Virginia. Let's just start out with what exactly you are making for the people in the community there. Sure. So uh, what we're actually doing is we're making these face shields and um, this is, would go over, obviously, the healthcare worker or the frontline worker's face and protect them from splashes or even airborne uh, items that would attach to the shield instead of attaching to their face and, and that's thus transmitting uh, any kind of bacteria or disease. Right, all right, and so you're doing all this with a 3D printer uh, and you were talking to me some about this yesterday. By the way, this isn't your job. You're a project manager for an engineering firm, right? Yes. Uh, and so this is just something you sort of got this 3D printer almost as a hobby a few years ago. And then yeah. something happened. You, you got to the point where you realized this is something you should do, something you could do. What was that yeah. moment for you? Well, yeah, I've been 3D printing for a couple of years now. i um, gone through a couple of different printers and I have a larger format one now that's able to take these kinds of things because this is, this is a pretty good uh, footprint of, of an item that needs to print. If, if you didn't have a bed big enough, you'd have to split it into a couple pieces or whatever and then assemble it together. So now that I've got a larger bed, I can print things like this. But really, there was a, a, a big push in the 3D printing community to step up and to help out and to um, you know make things and items uh, that are useful. And thought, you know what? Um, you know, these, these healthcare workers, these frontline people, they don't have the equipment they need. They're desperate for anything to cover their face and protect them. And uh, so, you know, I thought I could do this with my experience having a 3D printer, working uh, sure. with engineering, that I could put this together and, and make it happen. And uh, this is the result. So there you go, there you have it. And it's something that, as we were even mentioning before, we hear uh, during press briefings and everything else, big cities need these, small towns need them. What's the response been like for you? Where are you sending these? Who's getting those? Yeah, I mean, mostly local right now. Um, uh, people we know, uh, my wife is in healthcare industry, so she has a lot of friends and nurses and frontline people. Um, so we just kind of reached out on Facebook and said, hey, who could use something like this? EMS workers are begging for them. Uh, police officers are begging for them. You know, I was really moved by the response and people needing these. And I was shocked that, they, that all these people didn't have this equipment. And the fact that I could, you know, with what I've got around my house, I could put this together and protect someone. Uh, the response has been amazing. There have been, you know, so many pictures sent to me and, and thank yous and, and, and many things along those lines of people wanting now from out of states uh, messaging me saying, can you ship these to me? Um, so it's, it's, it's been really good. And so obviously, you know, you're doing this at your house. So it's not like you can mass produce at this point and you've been kind of funding it on your own as well, right? Yes. So what's the, what's the plan moving forward? What, what do you, what do well, you keep doing? I, I want to keep doing, I want to upscale this. I want to be so I can produce more a day. Uh, and to do that, the 3D printer, I either need more 3D printers <laughs> or I need to start making molds of the uh, of a printed frame so that I can then make more at a time. I'd like to get to make 10, 15 at a time. And then I'm servicing more people, helping more people. Um, and all that, you're right, with the funding, you know, I've been doing these for free. I've not been charging them for that. So here's a question for you. I, I mean, look, you're just a guy doing it, right? You just sort of stepped up and decided to do this. What's your message to other people out there that maybe think, hey, I could help, or should I help, or what should I do, or what can I do? Don't, don't wait, you know? If the, the longer you wait to get involved, the, the more behind the curve we're going to be. If you have a 3D printer, if you have the capabilities, not everybody does, you know, I understand that. But everybody can help in their own way and what they can contribute. And we need that now in the country. We need that in our local communities, people stepping up and helping out where they can. Well, Jeff Smith, really good to talk to you um, and great work that you're doing there. Thanks for taking a little bit of time today. No problem. Thanks, Jeremy. I'm Kelly Bender, the Pets Editor for People, and I'm here today with Nick Cullen, who is the Director of Kern County Animal Services in California. And your shelter recently came up with a creative way to find foster homes for pets because of the coronavirus pandemic. 
how did you come up with the kind of unique alternative of doing drive-through fostering and what was the logistics of pulling that off? On, uh, I think it was uh, March 12th, mm -hmm. uh, we found out, uh, or the, the, our county made the decision to close all county offices, essential services only. So what that meant for us as the um, animal shelter of record in Kern County, it meant that we uh, are closed to the public. So no public interaction. So the, the types of transactions that we would normally do with the public are no longer available. Um, most importantly, adoption. Then we just think, okay, how can we get these animals into foster and still observe social distancing measures, you know, six foot distance between, between people. And we just thought there's restaurants and there are businesses that are doing business solely by drive up and delivery. Right. How can we adapt that to animal fostering? We'll have people drive up, pop the trunk, open the back doors. We'll put everything in your car, including the pet. And we put an application up on social media. It was a Google document. And we just ask the community to fill out that document and we'll contact you as, as the, uh, the need arises. By that Thursday, the third day, we had well over 300 applications for people wanting to take foster pets. We sent 88 animals to foster care just in those first three days. And it was all drive through. Um, we were able to get these animals safely into foster homes. And out of the people who are contacting you about fostering or maybe have now started to foster, have you heard any kind of feedback about why they decided to make this decision and how they feel about it. So what we're seeing is an overwhelmingly positive response. And I tell you that one of the things that gets me choked up even now is that uh, we, we uh, threw up a, a social media post uh, that same week that we started the program. And we just simply said, hey, um, foster parents, you know, send us in some pictures or some videos of your fosters. And if you, if, if when we scrolled through those pictures, you wouldn't think a dog could smile, um, but they can. Yeah. And I'm telling you, that was what got me choked up is just to see the happiness in our community's faces amidst a pandemic, to be able to feel like you're helping your community, saving an animal's life, keeping an animal out of the shelter, just to see the smile on the pet's face and the family's face, and you know, that still, still kind of gets me. Was there anything else that you would like to add about your work, the fostering, or just anything to consider with pets at this moment in time? You know, there there are organizations across this country, you know, hundreds and thousands of animal welfare organizations that, that shelter animals, and they all need your help, you know, and you can't help them all. Um, and you can help by fostering a pet. You can help by adopting a pet. You can help by volunteering at that, that facility and you can help by donating. There's a lot of happy dogs out there, so I appreciate the work you're doing and the time you took to talk to me. Thank you. Well, thank you for reaching out, Kelly. It was a pleasure. I'm here with Nick Galvan, the operations manager for Irma Southwest in Houston. When restrictions began going across the country, there was a moment when he was thinking about how he was going to keep his staff until an unexpected gift arrived. Thank you for joining me, Nick. And yeah, please tell me, um, tell me about what it was like in Houston before you received your gift. It's like the rest of the country and much of the rest of the world, you know, we were a little down the dumps, especially once they canceled the rodeo. This is a huge, huge event for the city of Houston from both an entertainment perspective for those who are visiting as well as from a commerce perspective. It got real for everybody. The coronavirus definitely got real for everybody. And, you know, we started to really understand how truly serious the situation was. It's my understanding that your business immediately dropped off. Yes, we were planning on letting go the majority of our staff, at least go to limited hours on everybody. We, we weren't sure what we were going to do. And so we did receive a gift from one of our, you know, one of our regulars. He comes in all the time for the Astros games. There's 80 games in town. He's in, you know, he's in town for 60 of them. He left over uh, nine grand of tips for our staff, which he didn't have to do. And no one, you, no one should expect that. No one should be sitting there going, man, I really hope this happens. And no, no one should expect that. No one, no one, no one's assuming you're going to do that. And he didn't have to. You know, it, he, so he left that money for our staff and it's all going to the staff. And so that was a big morale boost for us as management, as ownership, as a whole establishment, really. 
how does that make you feel that someone would even think about doing that? It, it, it makes you feel loved. Uh, it makes you feel loved. It makes you feel appreciated. And you know, one thing and I, I've told, I'm telling everybody this, I'm telling my wife this, my friends this, if you have a place in your neighborhood, an little Italian spot, go give them something. It don't have to be nine grand, 900, 90, give them nine, you know, whatever you can do, you know, just show them that you really care. Everybody has a friend who's in this industry. Everybody has a cousin who's in this industry. There's a lot of people losing their jobs right now. So thank you for sharing your story because I think everyone needs, you know, a bright spot and know that people are helping people.